Fanfare too. Okay, we got yeah, we stop. Um, techno primitives and rains here tonight for this anyway. So, what would you say if I said climate change is a symbolic event? You are surrounded by and live through symbols and myths. Okay, so what then is a symbol? Symbols are exemplified by things like flags, which not only express a melange of feelings for place, loyalty, belonging, action sense of rightness, and so on, but also involve actions like treating the flag reverently, standing still when it's raised, and so on. A cross can stand for a whole series of teachings, feelings, and actions, and so can the Hajj. Symbols don't have exactly the same effect on everyone. Okay, think of a flag of a nation that you don't particularly like or don't care about. However, a symbol that works for us stands for complex feelings and understandings while at the same time organizing our ways of thinking and acting. Symbols are vehicles with which we try to conceive the inconceivable, those things that we cannot take into our hands and manipulate. Symbols always come into play when we ask fundamental questions such as what is the nature of existence? How are we entangled with existence? How are we to live? Why is suffering distributed unequally? What is really important? And so on. Thought about such problems, such mysteries, always involves something we are unconscious of, something which we can't conceive, which leaves the answers symbolic and makes them subject to the structures of myth. Climate change, at the least, involves the mysteries of our psychology, the world, nature, social and political action, morals, the future, who knows what the future is going to be, death and the distribution of suffering. It joins together a whole series of otherwise disparate issues and problems. By its widespread nature, climate change is messy and disordering. Being beyond conceiving and solving in a simple way, it becomes symbolic. Its symbolic form, then, is likely to overwhelm us and to go on on in incontrollable directions. We come, gr become gripped by panic, paralysis, purity, denial, and so on. Climate is also connected to our psychology in intimate ways. It provides symbols which we, we think about, which we feel and express ourselves with. Storms, heat, frost, desert, fire, inundations and floods all have psychological resonance. Such images appear vividly in our dreams, and we cannot be dispassionate about them. They map both our inner awareness and our unconscious. So as a result, these psychological resonances cannot be stripped away from the reality of climate change, however much we might try. So, what is a myth? A myth is a narrative which acts as a symbol and which links symbols and which structures our way of linking symbols. It is a shared template for living, a charter for behavior and for understanding, which may largely be unconscious. Myths and symbols are tied to our emotions, to our actions, and to our whole being. They make a living reality, and they are triggered almost automatically. What depth psychology shows is that human beings are primarily social, feeling, and imaginative creatures, not rational creatures. We are caught in and liberated by language, metaphors, images, and poetry. These imaginative factors make us feel that something is true without even thinking about it. Myth, in this sense, has nothing necessarily to do with the supernatural at all. Myths involve what we think of as history or of the nature of reality itself. Myths affect how we respond to scientific evidence, to stories, and to nature. Myths motivate us, but they also constrain us, all the more so when we are not conscious of them. So, what are the consequences of this? 
Scientists try to be rational about climate change and wonder why they, accuse, they are accused of falsehood or conspiracy or are seen as part of the problem. Driven by the myths of science, they discuss climate change in a way that has little complex symbolic impact or any great existential involvement. They, for instance, give fairly boring lists of data which go on and on and on and on and on. And what seems to the average person fairly unremarkable facts. A predicted increase in the temperature of two degrees hmm, might even make winter livable. At the same time as making the facts boring and isolating them from psychological processes, scientists and green organizers attempt to motivate people through warnings and overwhelming scenarios, leaving us no, with no sense of how we can escape, caught between boredom and panic. Rationality puts alarm, uh, puts, leads to widespread depression, to avoidance or to lack of energy in those it attempts to motivate. People turn away from the problem as it's too big. The science becomes wedded to myths of apocalypse, where the apocalypse is foredoomed by God and all the good people escape anyway. <laughs> we are largely rendered helpless by this myth. So-called climate skeptics, who we may define as those who believe a joint conspiracy of scientists and left-wing politicians is more probable than a conspiracy of energy corporations and right-wing politicians, <laughs> have, a much, have a much better time with myth and metaphor. They can claim that they are standing against dogma, that they are the bold minority fighting for truth and freedom. They can claim that any problems can be solved with technology and enterprise. Ironically, these are all myths that scientists have made much use of in the past. Skeptics can feel, appeal to our fear of loss in a positive and directive sense. Let's just get on with our lives. Let us leave it to the market and all will be well. We don't have to do anything. Their rhetorical and symbolic stance is much stronger. They can even claim that when scientists change the data or modify theories and predictions, that these scientists show weakness rather than their ability to adapt to reality and new data. This makes use of a monotheistic myth of truth which says the truth is stable and one and forever reliable. Skepticism may even provide relief after the depression generated by science and panic. We can now use our energy not just to fuel our fear, but to attack the dogma of climate change. So, climate change is enveloped in myth. We might see nature as a blissful Eden corrupted by humans, or we might see nature as hostile and brutish and as needing to be tamed, or as both simultaneously. We might see the world as dead matter needing, or, needing us or God to order it, or as a fragile organism in peril, or as both simultaneously. We might see nature as a creative and beneficent mother, endlessly providing, or we might see her as a hostile and constraining mother we need to slay to escape from. We might feel that we can overcome all problems through technological mastery, or we might feel that technology alienates us from the real natural world. We might, as already said, see disruptions of our life and our ways of life as apocalypse, and thus resign ourselves to it in fear or hope, or aim to slay those who are evil to show we are good and can escape. On reflection, you might find other myths that guide your thought. There are many other potential myths and symbols which can grab hold of the way we see the world and the way we act in it. All of these myths direct our behavior in certain ways and produce problems. Yet at the same time, myths and symbols also have the capacity to open us to new developments, new perceptions, new energies and imaginative responses, especially when we become aware of them. It becomes requisite that we discover new myths when the old ways of living are disrupted. Climate change, when taken seriously, disrupts almost all our previous modes of psychological, symbolic, and social ordering. It is not limited, and we cannot escape it. Discovering the myths we live by unconsciously and discovering new myths to live by is an imaginative and poetic task. And listening to Aboriginal storytelling is one way, though I'm not talking about Aboriginal storytelling, of course. That it involves, these myths involve our whole being. To live is an imaginative, poetic task, an attention to spontaneous sources of imagery that arise in our dreams, in our waking fantasies, to the metaphors we speak, to the things that we might normally neglect as unimportant or disordered. 
facing and contemplating this internal and external disorder, this arising of image and symbol from the unconscious, then new ways of being and action can arise and be shared with others. However rational we think we are, we live in a shared world of myths and symbols, and once this is recognized, we can start to use these myths rather than just be used by them. Thank you. Thank you.